I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 12, chapter 12 and I'm going to read uh, uh, beginning at verse 5. I'm going to be reading the New King James Version. I normally read the, read the King James, but it uh, really doesn't matter which version you're reading. You're going to get my point. Come on, Pastor. Amen. It was, it was a good catch. You have to understand something. God's walking with you and talking with you. You decide who and what you're going to be. Now understand, God isn't going to invite each and every one of us into the battle because he's already done that in his word. So you decide who and what you are. You can't turn around and look and say, well, I didn't know. You can't turn around when the cop pulls you over and say, I didn't know. <laughs> Signs are posted, lights are posted, lines are everywhere. And that, that little booklet you got to go through, hello, read the book. Read the book. Are you ready? And the Lord answers Jeremiah. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? If in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Let's place our Bibles down. Let's talk to the Lord that we get understanding tonight. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, with your spirit, your presence, your power, your word, God. I need your unction and your anointing to bring forth this into the hearts of people who are going to live through the last days and the things that are going on in our world, God. Help us to be filled with the spirit, presence of God, anointed and on fire and ready to answer the call that's gone forth. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Now, I will say, I want to give honor to whom honor is due, that Sister Erica and Brother Davenport in my past have a, had a little effect on this message tonight. I am wearing my cow kickers for a reason. But I'm going to get right into this. It's easy to be a freeloader. It's easy to be a leech. It's easy to not make a difference. Right now, there are NFL teams across the United States doing their training to get ready. And during the season, you're going to see those on the field. They're going to get dirty. They're going to get hurt. They're going to bleed. But they're going to be involved. And if you pay attention at every at the end of every game, which I'm not admonishing you to do that, you will see at the end of the game there will be those jumping on a victory that have immaculate jerseys. There ain't a speck on them. There's not a wound on them because they're on the bench. You hear what I'm saying? It's easy to relax in the embracing arms of the average. It's easier but it's not better. It's easier, but it's not more significant. It's easier, but it's not fulfilling. God has called you, his people, to a life of purpose, not pointlessness. Second Timothy, Paul speaking, Paul speaking, saying, listen, Paul went through some stuff, and he's letting this young man know for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we've been called to war and you ain't fighting, if you're not in the battle. So what puzzles me in life is why even Christian people live so badly. It's not that everyone lives wickedly, although there are a number that do. But even those that don't live wickedly, 
church folks, anointed, word of God, sword in the hand, Holy Ghost filled. Seems so content to be ordinary. Fine with the mundane and okay with the everyday grind of not making a difference. Isaiah 53, 13 and 14 says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And they're honorable men. Honorable men are famished. So I don't care how honorable or important anyone thinks we are if you're famished. You're famished, you're frail. And their multitude dried up with thirst. If the leaders are famished, if the leaders are frail, Where's the rest of the family? And because the leaders, the anointed, those that say, I'm a man of God, I'm a lady of God, are famished. The Bible says hell hath enlarged herself. If you get on the sidelines, if you sit in the bench, you better believe the enemy will take the field. Don't get upset at what's happening in the world if you're not out there in the fight. It says, therefore, health hath enlarged herself. She can enlarge herself in your home and with your family if you've abdicated the throne, put down your sword, and laid silent. Health hath enlarged herself, opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he, hath re he that rejoiceth descended into it. Even those who should be prominent, anointed, and powerful in the church, leave little to admire and much less to imitate. We watch in our, our world and famous entertainers amuse a world full of bored sleepwalkers. Spoiled athletes play games for lazy spectators. Insane criminals plaster our headlines for couch potatoes entertainment. And if you're content with the status quo, saint of God, if you too are more interested in the lazy days, if you're content to just live life in the ordinary, then you'll fit right in with those folks. And what would be the difference? But if you're tired of the norm, if you're sick of the headlines, if you're incensed by the wickedness that permeates our society, if radio and entertainment and, and whatever it is, if, you, if you've at all felt the tug in your spirit and soul and hunger after righteousness, then, then this brief message is for you. The condition of our society has deteriorated. Things even happened today that even a year ago to you would not think it could happen. It is speeding up, folks. We've become a nation that instead of punishing crime, we've elevated obscure criminals to become national heroes and even made monuments. Christians have become more interested with the latest immoral scandals than the moving of the Spirit of God. Gossip columns run much longer than the Good Samaritan columns. Telephones, cell phones, text messaging, emails, buzz with, not with prayer requests, with the hot and juicy information that's just been passed on with the, oh my, and I can hardly believe it. Did you know? Guilty of this last night. But if, on the other hand, we look around for what it means to be spiritually mature, to be whole, to be a truly blessed person, we don't find much. These saintly people are around. 
maybe as many as we've ever had. But they are not easy to pick out. No journalist is rushing in here to interview you. No talk show will feature them. They're not even admired. They're not looked up to. In fact, it's so bad that our children looked up to stuff out there and peers out there and kids out there instead of people of God in here. And why can we blame them? Why would they look up to people sitting in the bleachers? Why would they look up to your Christianity when it's mundane, ordinary? Why would they look up to what you're doing if you're not even excited about it? Hmm. Even the so-called those that will self-promote their righteousness and their right have seemingly no value in them. They'll not get an Oscar <laughs> for the act. They'll never make the list for the top 100 most influential people in America, never mind the church. Nevertheless, in my text this evening, there is a dialogue between God and Jeremiah that sounds like most of us when life doesn't go the way we expect it to or we don't get what we want. Listen to these statements from Jeremiah in uh, the question. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Jeremiah 12, 1 4. Yet let me talk with you about your judgments. I, I mean, I've even heard saintly saints question God's wisdom when everything don't go how we want, expect, or even demand. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Come on now, can we be real? Come on, parents, you're hearing it from your own kids about what's going on. Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why, why are the worldly so happy? You have planted them. Yes, they have taken root. They grow. Yeah, they, they, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You have seen me. And you have tested my heart towards you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there because they said, he will not see our final end. Another translation says it like this. You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why do all the faithless live at ease? Are you hearing me? Does any of this sound familiar to you? I, full confession. Yeah, I, I've been a big whiny baby before. I'll say it because I know if I say it, you don't have to. I've had a few times... I've uttered the words why through a, a broken voice of prayer and tears strolling down my face and despondency in my mind. Come on. We question God when trials, troubles hit our life. I've realized that we can be whiners sometimes. I've also noticed that we have a tendency to whine more when we feel overburdened or overworked or too much is on our plate. We're stressed or just plain busy. You see what I'm doing, God? I'm working hard. Shouldn't that open the door of ease for me? You see my labor. You see what I'm doing. Come on, Lord. You see what I'm doing. I clean the church on Saturday. Surely I should get a raise at work. I, I, I invited someone to church. Surely all of a sudden, I should get a new car. 
I know you see me, Lord. We get upset because we think the world's not working the way we think it should work. We want somebody to stop all the craziness that we see and hear and feel around us. And this is where Jeremiah's at. He's saying to God, you need to take these evil folks out so all will be right in the world because we want things right for us. Look, I'll tell you right now, when I hit the freeway, I want it to part for me. When I'm running late, I'm, I'm like, those lights are doing it on purpose. They Look, some of the hours I've been driving back and forth, there's nobody on the road, and I'm heading to a green light, and it'll turn red, and there's nobody. Oh, I got some words. I got some thoughts. In full confession, I've looked, and I've just gone. <laughs> Jeremiah's saying, you need to take these evil folks out so everything will be right in my world. Listen, God, they'll believe in you more if you do what I say. <laughs> Is this okay tonight? However, in full transparency and honesty of biblical study, you'll find God has another idea about what should be happening and why. We know this because God offers Jeremiah a simple riddle-like statement of understanding and then a statement of hope for everyone. It says in verse 5 and 6, if you have raced with the men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? If you stumble in a safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Verse 6, your brothers, your own family, even they have betrayed you. They have raised a loud cry against you. Do not trust them, though they speak well of you. It's what it says. We, the, the Bible tells us in the last days, the enemies were those of your own household. you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. you got to make sure you're trying to be at peace with everybody and forgetting about being right with God. God is reminding Jeremiah, it's not about the evil people in the world, and it's not about what you want. Oh, wait a minute. You thought Christianity was a fire escape, and your heavenly father is going to give you every doting little thing you have. Uh, last I checked, we're not our own. It's funny, we've been bought with a price, but he ain't had a say over us in how many years? You see, our purpose in our life is not our life. Wherever you find yourself being called to serve, it is your role to follow through no matter the cost. You can't listen to those around you. You can't even listen to your family and friends. It's God that matters. It is God that calls you. It is God that endorsed you. It's God that rewards you, not those around you. Get this straight. Get this in your spirit. Get this in your crawl. Hard times come to Christians because our reactions in bad times are to inspire others to turn to the Lord and seek forgiveness. Do I need to say that again? You, when you're going through it, you are you are to be an example. You are to be, you are to shine as lights in darkness. You are to say, no more darkness. If there's no darkness, how do you shine? If there's no trouble, how can you triumph? Jesus. Just as Jesus was a witness to the world to his suffering, we are to be witnesses as we, as we draw closer to him and take up what? Our cross. Following the Lord has a cost and a huge reward. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake. You better check yourself and realize you better make sure your balance is right towards God and not the people 
You better make sure you're pleasing God and not family and friends and society. Oh, this sounds the opposite of our flesh, but understand, flesh isn't going to make it to heaven. It's your soul and spirit. For my sake, we'll receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Did you hear that? He will reward the sacrifice you make to follow him, to put him first. You see, to be following him, ain't got, you ain't got a bunch of family there. It's you and Jesus. I'm going to please him. That's a fight in and of itself. That's difficulty in and of itself. That's a problem right there because some of us, all of a sudden, our name is more important than Jesus' name. We are to take up our cross and follow him. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What's Jesus saying? The line of demarcation is found in what you've given up. And why? Not what you've collected, not what you've assembled, not, your, not, not, men will pat you on the back, but let me ask you this, is Jesus going to? Men will shake your hand and embrace you, and you're all, but you've done things to please them. Nobody, anybody here ever done that? You know, you knew you were going to get, you knew. They go, no, I did that. You know, the whole group didn't, but you had someone else. Yeah, I did. Come on, that's what we do. Listen, when a person starts asking for the Holy Spirit to come in and guide their life, It can be quite scary. That's why many balk. That's why many put their hand to the plow and then look back. They start strong and fade. It's throughout Scripture. Because drawing closer to God can require walking through tough times. And that's the point. Mary found favor, and look what happened next. You hear what I'm saying? There are things and times and situations we never would have chosen for ourselves. But in retrospect, those times that built our faith because we can look back in amazement of what God did for us and in us. And that's the point. To come through time and trials, giving glory to God. Not find yourself on the sideline, embittered by something that you would not have chosen. I've been there. I know what it's like. And those you care about don't listen. That's what he said in verse 7. After that statement, 5 and 6, he's talking about the horseman. Said, Wait a minute, I, I know what that's like. You see, in many ways, this dialogue that's going on reminds me of discussions that you find between people in a recovery program or children with parents. When you've been through something, when you've been through something and you meet somebody else years later that's going through it, you are now a guide. In, 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 in recent months, it has blown my mind. And Brother Pew's long gone. And uh, he made a statement to me years ago. You're going to have a witness and a testimony, and you're going to be able to help people in a way I can't. I didn't know how many. And recently, I've, I've had uh, almost a different individual going through now, I'm not talking about just somebody in the church. I'm talking about men that pastor churches. I'm talking about evangelists. I'm talking I'm on the phone that I'm helping through what I went through. And that teaches us. God didn't put you through something to hurt you. Put you through that to make you so he will get glory. If, 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 if you're known more for your name than Jesus' name, you miss the message. You miss the point. If, well, why are you taking up a cross if it's not about Jesus? You want everybody to see you. You took up a cross instead of, no, wait a minute, it's his cross, I'm carrying it. 
I'm his hands, I'm his feet, I'm his mouthpiece. Are oh, you understand? It's amazing. I, I've gone through so many things, and, and almost 20 years ago, and here I am now helping others through what I went through. So for us Christians, when we share this same kind of bond with Jesus, the actions as he walks through, through humanity, he understands what you're going through. In fact, let me say, she may, if you allowed him to order your steps, purposely brought you through something so he can get glory and others could follow. Paul said, follow me as I what? The problem with some of us, we get embittered towards what we went through and people follow us to the sideline. They follow us to becoming bitter. They follow us to become church hoppers or hateful towards the kingdom of God. And when I say the kingdom of God, you don't like somebody in the church. You're upset at the pastor. You don't like this song. You don't like the worship. You don't like church. You, 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 you got an opinion about everything, but never about pleasing and giving glory to God. Now, hold on. I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger at nobody. I'm pointing a finger at all of us. We all struggle with these vicissitudes of life, and we, we get upside down and topsy-turvy with God. But he understands what we're going through. It says in Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we were, yet without sin. Though it's easy to, there's really no need for us to whine or complain about our lives because we don't want to be on the sidelines. Get the, get, get the connection. Jesus walked in once, and he is present to walk with us right now. It says in Hebrews, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. If you're constantly needing or wanting more, you've missed it. If you have that, but you're not wanting a closer walk with Jesus, or you're not pointing to him, in fact, I made a statement to someone the other day. There are too many uttermost saints and few doing the work. There are too many that want accolades without anointing. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What's he saying? You have to understand, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But if you put him on the sidelines because you got other things, he didn't leave you, he didn't forsake you. You walked away. You didn't want the battle. Because the battle is where he gets glory. Man, I'll be honest. I, just, I don't know how many times I knew the, my struggle was I'm so busy trying to, to walk the comfortable paths that I don't want to go on the difficult paths. Come on. Why can't life just be easy? Am I the only one that's ever said that? Why, 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 why does the guy, the sister, sister Carol came in today, and, and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we got a lot of stuff going on. It's, how's your arms? Now, you know what I said? You know what? I'm so old now. I don't know if they're going to get better. i got to live with it. That sometimes you just got just to gotta embrace that every day I'm going to have pain in my life. Okay, I got that. I'm going to deal with that. I'm, I'm going to sideline that, not me. For he saith, I will never leave thee, no for safety. Listen, so that we, everybody say we, may boldly say, <laughs> It's not about things. It's not about stuff. It's about walking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's about saddling up, saying, let's ride. I'm staying in the battle. Why? So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. One writer said it this way. The purpose of life is the building of character through truth, and you don't build character by being a spectator. God walks with each and every one of us by way of the Holy Spirit. He is here to guide, to encourage, and to remind us. The Bible says, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Philippians, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. I, 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 I'm not saying it's easy. There'll be plenty who give up. Look around, watch. You're going to see them go to the sideline 
not show up, not be there, not take on a task. You're going to watch it your entire life. You're going to be able to turn around and say, we couldn't get anybody to stay and help. We couldn't get this. Or, They're not this. Whatever. Okay, let them go. But are you saddling up? Are you still in the saddle? Are you still ready to say, it don't matter. Let's ride. There'll be plenty who turn back. You can look at the sidelines and there will be crowds of people beckoning you to come and put up your feet. There will even be some tempted to try to take a shortcut by doing anything to get out of walking their path. Jeremiah learned that. God knew that. The point I'm making is this. The Lord allows and even calls us to be overcoming people. He calls us to be the head and not the tail. He calls us to be above and beneath. People that rise up in the face of adversity, show up in the face of fear. Courage is being scared and saddling up anyone. That's what that is. It's not the absence of struggle. First, so in the end, those who see and watch the reactions of believers in bad times will, can, and are supposed to be inspired to turn to the Lord and seek forgiveness. Just as Jesus was a witness to the world through his suffering, we are to be witnesses to the world through ours. If people know you've been through a struggle, they're watching what you're doing. Are you going to quit? Come on, you got to understand it. It, You may not have had this kind of element. You get in a fight, so you're going to cry? No, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. What's it saying? What's he saying? I get it. You're wearied by just daily life? You barely make it to church and prayer and being involved and putting God first just with daily life. And how are you going to saddle up when problems come? God allows. Hear me. I remember I was sitting at a table and I was messing with a light. And I wanted to put an inline switch on it. So my dad went and got me a little inline switch. This is just one example. My dad was constantly teaching me things. But I suffer through it, figure it out. I'll give you this. I'll say, do this, do this, hold it, go. And when I was when I was about eight years old, no, before it was, I was younger than that. We had just bought the property in California. The orchard was a spooky place at night. When you have an orchard of trees and a slight breeze and you got leaves rustling and wild dogs in the distance and a raccoon can be a grizzly bear to a seven-year-old. Come on, son. Let's go. Oh, boy. We walk out there to the carport. I want you to walk down to the levee and back in the dark. You know I never cheated. I walked down to the levee and back in the dark. And a monster never got me. Because he was teaching me, you're going to go through dark times, but you're going to be all right. I remember when he took my training wheels off. And so he wanted me to put this inline switch on this thing. And I got it on there, and I wasn't thinking. That was a box of rocks, but thought I knew everything. Now, just about to squeeze those things down and that that metal was going to make that connection but I didn't put it on one side I put it down the middle and he stopped me at the last minute hold up and he explained to me he's teaching me anybody teaching your kids teaching your family and we expect our heavenly father just to leave us walking around ignorant 
God allows and even orders our overcoming situations as a way to draw closer to him in this life, to remind us of our reliance on him. See, when you forget to rely on him, you trust in your own self. When you trust in your own self, you question your future. But when you rely on him, you have a hope in him for your future. It is with that understanding in mind, there is never really a good reason to whine, cry, and complain. In fact, those that murmur and complain, go look that up about being lost. So we're called to rejoice in what Jesus did for us when he suffered and died on the cross, right? Yeah. He paved the way for us to follow. If we're to rejoice that he did it, should we not we rejoice when we get to? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life with trials, with struggle, struggle, struggles and troubles. You see, a true blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled child of God, forgiven of their sins, their name recorded in the Lamb's book of life, life, taking up their cross has a final destination of heaven. And the devil can't stop that. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. So regardless of trials, regardless of opposition, regardless of obstacles, we are never called to run with the turkeys, but rather to fly with eagles. So that when we finally get to the point where we are thoroughly disgusted with the way this world is going, and we've had enough with trying to find comfort and pleasure and utopia here, when we get tired of the pig slop that's being fed us, that the, when we decide we no longer want to walk in that pig pen, we will rise up like the prodigal and look at the father's house again with the newest understanding. I want to get back to the gladness of the rules, of the chores, of the work of the father's house. And say, so, let me back at it. Let me back involved in what the father's do. Get me back in there cleaning the step. I'll saddle up. I'm ready to ride, Jesus. What can I do in the father's house? No trial. After coming to that revelation, should tire us, should weary us, should ever allow us to talk bad or disdain the father's house or any of the other children there. Get up off to anybody that you don't think's doing enough. If you got time to see them, you got time to do more. You got something to complain about, I got something for you to do. He said the laborers are few. Boy, we could get another church building. We got enough so-called preachers around here to do it. But we just show up anointed on fire. Are you ready to saddle up and ride? Quit talking. Saddle up. Put your boots on. Grab your hat. Listen, listen, listen. All of us like the starving prodigal. He'd been so far from the father's house physically, but he was even farther spiritually. He was misaligned desperately. You have to understand something deep down inside of us. There's a God instilled hunger. But if you keep filling it with the junk food, if you keep eating like Christian did on Sunday night, you're going to wake up sicker than a dog on Monday. You wonder why you're sick spiritually. You wonder why you're bitter. You wonder why you. You wonder why it's easy to justify doing nothing. You need to understand. You you may you you're so far away from the alignment with the Father. You're upset at Him. Oh, if we could just get ourselves back in the right mindset and spirit, and allow that familiar fragrance of the Father's house to come down that dusty road of rebellion. That spiritual aroma would ignite the cravings for wholeness, freshness, and anointing, a hunger for righteousness to do the work and the will of God. And like, hey, hey, I, when the Titanic was sinking, was anybody trying to paint it? Was anybody trying to pretty it up? Did anybody go to their estate room and make their bed? Why are we spending so much time on a world that's sinking when we got a kingdom to build? When it's time to saddle up, let's ride and do the work of God. Let's reach someone. Let's teach someone. Let's preach to someone.
Let's bring someone to church. Let's reach mom, dad, brother, sister. But all we do, let's get in saddle and let's ride. Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You'll never find fulfillment in following after the worldly activities of celebrities or the things of this world. They will leave you empty. They will leave you wanting, and they'll leave you lost. And we see it. We read it on the pages of Scripture where you find men and women of faith who were made from the same lump of clay that you and I were. And from their lives were shown their risings, their downfalls, their accomplishments, their failures, their struggles and successes. But what sets people apart? It's the fact that they had a hunger for righteousness. They set their mind and heart to follow after God. We read Hebrews 11, that chapter of faith. We, if, if you know anything about your Bible, you start reading, say, wait a minute, these guys messed up. So what's your problem? The stories are giving. They're given to us as examples of how we should live. No, we don't look at them as heroes. Can I? None of them are heroes, right? And neither are we. But it's heroic when you stand up with imperfections, with failures and faults and saddle up and ride anyway. Yeah, it's heroic. In the time that some of us realize they have a testimony, that it's our turn for a testimony to follow Christ, those people that we meet on the pages of Scripture, they are remarkable for their intensity. They lived in righteousness and holiness unto God. How can we do any less? When we look at people like Joseph, he could have let down his moral standard of conduct and melted to the seducing wiles of Potiphar's wife. But he ran from temptation. He saddled up, time to ride. He kept his integrity. He kept his commitment intact. That's what that's really all about. We can look at the three Hebrew children who could have swayed in their faith at the thought of being burned alive in a fiery furnace. But you know, they saddled up and said, let's ride. <laughs> they wouldn't bow their knees to the images. You know, We can look at Daniel who's about to become a two-piece dinner for a pack of hungry lions. But you know what he did? He saddled up. It was his moment to put up or shut up. Pull the boots on, saddle up. Let's ride. He refused to give up on his prayer line. We can look at the mother of Moses who could easily have succumbed to the fear of Pharaoh, giving up her baby boy to be killed all along with all those thousands of other baby boys. But rather, by faith, she saddled up, hit him in an ark, the riverbank, knowing, trusting that God would protect him. We can look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, who could have doubted what was taking place. How can God be in this? I expected smooth sitting on him. How many of us get bitter, get mad, hate God, hate the church, hate life? Try to find some little hidden utopia in this world. I'll tell you where utopia is. It's saddling up and riding, getting your way to heaven. She began to carry the Savior of the world and lived her faith according to the angel's words. Brought forth that precious baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Do you understand what I'm speaking to you and teaching you tonight? All these that I've mentioned and more could have just said, eh, I'll pass. I think I'll just go find my seat on the sidelines. I just want to be normal. I, I just, want to, just, just want to find my seat and find myself among the mundane, become a second-class citizen, the things of God. 
Gideon. You could tell that story. Going to set, going to battle with thousands. And he starts off, okay, we got a good group. Oh, no, 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 no. You know what he did? The first separation was get rid of the, the who? The what? The fearful. Get rid of the, the, the fearful. <clears throat> you can't take the fearful with you in the battle. It can be deduced, deduced that the, uh, the original number of Gideon's men was 32,000 because only 10,000 remained after 22,000 left who were fearful and afraid. I'm not going to apply those percentages here. But between now and Sunday, you'll decide who you are. Next week, you'll decide. The week after that, what you've been doing is letting you know. That'll make sense here again in a minute. God considered the 10,000 that was left and I guess extrapolated the number of 405,000 enemies was still too many when the ratio is one for every 40.5 opponents for still too many, Gideon. He could have said, you know, I'm out, God, right here. It needs to look how I want it to look for me to. Stop a minute. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to show you it doesn't need to look like what you think it to look like to be victorious. Can we allow God to kind of slip back on the throne tonight? Can, can we go ahead and lay aside all of our thoughts and preconceived ideas and opinions and say, you know what, let me just step back till I know I'm saddled up and on my horse right now. Can I go ahead and step back from, you know, there's more to saddling up than having a pair of boots and a hat. At some point, you got to saddle up, get on a horse and ride. You got to put up or shut up or you're all hat. Making sense? And it was still too many. God did that last test and left with 300. You know what Gideon said? Saddle up. Let's ride. What? Does that, doesn't that do something? It does something to me. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that it does. If it, if it doesn't do something to you, there's an altar word that could change that tonight. Paul admonished Timothy. He admonished him with his own life. And he's saying, Timothy, saddle up. Now, he didn't say it like that. He said it like this. I fought a good fight. I wonder why he talked about the fight first. Because that's the important part. That's, I finished my course. You have to understand, son. You can't finish the course if you don't stay in the fight. You got to saddle up. I get it by the boots, uh, by the hat. But at some point, son, you better go ahead and put the saddle on that bronc and get riding or you're all talk. And he said to him, I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, listen, listen, listen. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Paul's crown of righteousness ain't going to help Timothy. Which the Lord, the righteous, just shall give me at that day. And what he says? And not to me only, but unto all them that also love is your prayer. You know what he said? Saddle up, Timothy. Saddle up. It's time to ride. Saddle up, son. There's a time when you got to quit talking about it, quit acting it, quit being all show, quit being all hat. Get the hat. By all means, get the boots. But at some point, you've got to throw that saddle on and say, it's time to ride. It's time to get in the fight. It's time to get in the battle. It's time to truly stand up and open your mouth. The only reason evil prevails is because men sit silent. He was a sweet psalm singer. He was the worshiper. A man after God's own heart. Psalms 144 is the psalm of David. I'm glad you could worship. I'm glad you can quote a few scriptures every now and then. I, I'm glad you've done a few things for God over the time. But he makes this statement. He says, blessed be the Lord my strength.
which teacheth, teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. You know what he's saying? Saddle up. Saddle up. It's time to ride. Saddle up. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they, if you're weary today, how are you going to contend with the horses? This text comes in a time in Jeremiah's life when he's been worn down by the opposition and absorbed in self-pity. Self-pity is fueled by the fact, I didn't get what I wanted to do. Come on, y'all deal with it, baby. Hey, wait a minute, you live here, you here for free, you can do the dishes. <laughs> God does so much for us, and all of a sudden we start whining because there's an expectation of saddling up. Hey, you know what? One of the worst things you ever said, man, God's been good to me, but have you been good to God? Well, God's blessed me, but had you blessed God, it's time to saddle up and make sure you get things in the right direction. He was faced with the Listen, Jeremiah was faced with the option to surrender to a premature death. He was facing the decision to abandon his unique calling of God and settle for being average. It's his turn. He's facing it. That's what we're reading. We're, we're putting his life under a microscope here. And God says, hey, hey. If thou hast run with a footman, they wear it. How are you going to contend with the horses? Listen, Jeremiah, life's difficult. Life has trials, twists, and turns. What are you saying? Are you going to quit in the face of opposition now? You pass those tests so you could step onto the field. And now your moment comes and you, you're going to retreat? You're going to run for the sidelines? You're going to make for the snack bar and the bleachers? Are you going to run for home the minute you find that the mass of men and women are more interested in keeping their feet warm than living at risk of giving glory to God? Are you going to go with the flow of the crowd and head for the seats of spectators when things get tight? You're going to bellow out of your mouth when things get tough and we got to buckle down and say, leave me out of it. What will, you, what will be written down? What will your words be? What will your actions declare? Are you going to live cautiously or courageously? God has called us to live in our best, to pursue righteousness, to sustain a drive towards excellence. He said, I called thee. Jeremiah says this, before I formed thee. In the belly, I knew the, what you think was different with you. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet under the nations. Wait, let me tell you something. If you're good at declaring who you are to people, have you heard what God declared to you? Hold on a minute, because when you say it, that's a thus saith the Lord. Have you heard? Did you really hear? Oh, let me tell you something. I question my status here all the time. I question it. I want to make sure I heard from God because the last thing I want to do is preach to others and be a castaway. Oh, are you hearing what I'm saying? That's not indictment. Oh, let me go find a sideline. No, you know what it means? It means saddle up and ride. That way I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I was called. What is heaven's expectation of you and I? Anybody here been called to a higher place? Anybody here been called to ministry? Anybody here been called to something? Let's all stand. It's personal. But it's known publicly. Who is this? It's the son of Jesse. I didn't call him. It don't matter. God did. 
what's my brother doing? I didn't call you. No, but the Lord did. How many have heard the call? Sister Faith, I have been completely inspired by you bringing your friends. Sister Christian, keep on. Crystal, keep. That's my bad. Keep inspiring these young girls. I can't imagine what Jonathan's going to be if he's surrounded by three amazing godly girls. I'll tell you what, you all better watch out. Have you heard his call? Have you felt that tug? Anybody here tonight been moved by his word? I know, I know that I go back and in my mind, I remember the service that I was in in Napa when I felt the call. The building was full of people. There was multiple people in the altar. And none of them were aware of it unless God told them that my life was about to change. My future was going to change. I remember praying and I felt the gigantic hand of Matt's dad who wanted me to Jim Monroe, put it on my shoulder. And he just started praying for me. He keep him in our prayers. He's got cancer right now. It means a lot. He was there praying for me when I literally came out of my when it literally came out of my mouth. I will do it, God. 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 Nobody else knew. Nobody else. Nobody else really realized what was going on. But if I never got to that, and I never saddled up in tough times and bad times and said, let's ride. If I could pass anything on to you, if I could give you anything, I know it's easier to be a freeloader. It's easier to be a leech. It's easier to relax in the embracing arms of average, find the sideline of safety and no longer matter. It's easier, but it ain't better. It's easier, but it's not significant. It's easier, but it's not fulfilling. So will you listen? Will you slough it off and say next time in disregard? God's called you to a life of purpose far beyond what you think you're capable, but that's what he does. So now, as we face the difficulty, as you face your difficulty, the difficulty of maybe walking out to that spiritual barn in front of a family that watched you put the horse away a long time ago. Worrying about what they might say to you like that big brother on the hillside. What's the sound down there? What's he doing home? Something happens to you when you come back to the father's house with the right mind. And I don't know who came in here with the right mind today. And who's willing to say, you know what? I ain't wearing these boots and this hat for nothing. It's time to saddle up and ride like I've never ridden before. It's time to get my hands on that harness. I don't want to be a run of the mill. Nobody. So if the world's bothering you right now, what are you going to do when the world race starts? What are you going to do when the horsemen start running. What are you going to do when it gets serious? Well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do, Jeremiah? What do you want to do, saint of God? What are you going to do with it? You need to forget about me right now and start out. What are you going to do in these last days? What are you going to amount to? What is it that you want? Do you want to shuffle along with a mundane crowd? Or do you want to run with the horses? Hold on. It's unlikely, I think, but I doubt that Jeremiah... <laughs> Just jumped to, he weighed his options. Be cerebral now.
I believe he looked at it. But he kind of considered it. Nothing wrong in sizing it up. Considered his options. You too got to consider. Well, I can die prematurely. I can die. And you can die in your bed with a house and property full of worldly accomplishments. Well, you can saddle that horse and go riding into the battle doing the work of the Lord. I get it. There's comfort on the sidelines that beckons. There's safety of the status quo that calls. Oh, when the crowd of self-preservations beckons you, when those who don't have the guts, you're surrounded by those that cower in the face of crisis come calling you. The question really is, when it gets tough, when it gets costly, when the dying yourself is the only way, You got the hat. You got the boots. But will you saddle up? Will you run with the horses? Will you saddle up and declare, let's ride? The answer to Jeremiah's story came with his life. His life was his answer. His commitment declared what he did. The story told itself. He saddled up and said, let's ride with the horses. The Lord placed it to him. If you're worried now, what are you going to do? You know what he said? I'm going to ride. I'll run with the horses. He declared in Jeremiah 20 and 9, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with all. You understand, he was weighing his options. I'm tired of holding back. I'm tired of being on the side. I'm tired of thinking about the easy way out. I'm tired of not mattering. I'm tired of showing up to watch. I took the liberty. I'm not a songwriter, but I rewrote a song today. You're going to have to get excited on your own juices. That ain't my job. I hope help, it'll help some of you understand the difference between worldly mentality and the mentality of a saint of God, a Christian in the church. I say it in love. I say it pastorally. I say it because God's trying to get a hold of some of you. We are the Christians. The true sons of freedom. We've answered the call to get the Lord's work done. We're preaching his word so the lost can find salvation. We're rounding them up and leading them home. Christians are really not just average people. Americans, Mexicans, black men and Jews. We love this old story. We don't want to lose. We're, they're counting on me and they're counting on you. The Lord is always watching, so we won't not stop praying. The fighting will continue until heaven is done. There are many who are lost, so we'll just have to lead them. It's every Christian's call until we get the work done. We are the Christians, the true sons of freedom. We've answered a call to get the Lord's work done. We're preaching his word so the lost can find salvation. We're rounding them up. And lead them home.